doing is he's slowly surfacing that metal. And you see him using that file, it's to identify all the high spots. What we want to do is we kind of want to be able to match the original contour and slowly surface that metal up. That file is adjustable, so it, we can get it to where it'll cut just the crowning issues. When I say crowning, I mean literally the high points on an actual curve. And we identify those and we set those down, and then eventually the metal will be back to pretty close to the way it's supposed to be. Okay, in that shot you just saw, when you're using a straight edge, it's reasonably flexible. It helps us identify where the imperfections are because once you start removing paint and you have high and low spots, it's very hard to see what is or what is not right. So we use a straight edge that has somewhat flexibility to it because it shows us what the natural line was. This is the area we just worked. We've concluded that this is just about as good as it can get. But we also now notice that the area right in front of the filler door is really, really off. If I didn't have a straight edge here, you can't see it. It's very difficult to see that kind of deviation. But now that we see that, we know where we need to focus our energy, driving that out. When it's all said and done, this entire area was probably pushed in close to an inch, and it was all made up in the body filter. Um, and again, we don't know the circumstances as to why that decision was made at the time this thing had its accident. So we're not being critical. But we do know this. The deviation right now, the low spot, is about a half inch right here. We haven't really worked this area yet, but we did get this area sorted out. So now we're going after the rest of the low spot. And that should get us in a pretty good area where we can kind of quit working the metal. When doing metal work, you always want to start from the lowest area and work your way towards the deepest section of the dent. You never want to go straight at the deepest portion of the dent first. Um, you're only going to stretch the steel and you're never going to make that metal right. Okay, so Johnny and I have been on this for a couple days now. We're starting to expose the framework of everything that holds the floors in place. Now, the floors are fairly a stripped down version of the originals. They don't come with seat rails, so if you're doing this, make sure you don't throw those away. Anyhow, why we're at this, we're going to take advantage of improving the chassis stiffness. Instead of just resistance welding this in, like it was from the factory, we're going to do some full stitch welding. That's also going to add to the strength of the overall chassis of the car. More importantly, what's really going to do is to make the car's handling characteristics a little bit more improved as well. Uh, this is pretty intensive stuff. Because we've done it so many times, we know where to go at it. Um, but if you're going to do this yourself, uh, I'll, first of all, you're going to need an arsenal of tools. Um, secondly, you should always have a respirator because a lot of the undercoating systems from back in the day have pretty harsh chemicals in them that are simply not easy to on your lungs to inhale. Um, but lastly, um, you need to set aside at least, if you're doing it by yourself for the first time, a couple of weeks. Um, we'll have this done in a couple of days, but uh, again, that's because we've done it a few times. So the last time this car was on the road was 1978. That means more or less that this thing only had 10 years of driving experience before it was shelved. But what was interesting was the amount of metal patching that was done on these floors. I mean, think about the car's only been on the road for 10 years and there's significant metal placement on the floors. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's not much of a wonder as to why the light car didn't survive over the years. What we're focusing on right now, though, is we're putting floor back in before we start focusing on the rockers. Now, once we start doing the rockers, if we have to go deep and extensive in those, we're going to have to frame up the uh, interior of the car to make sure that nothing changes when we start taking some of the infrastructure away. Um, right now, all we're really going to focus on is over here, 
for the pan to drop in underneath the rocker to be welded, we have to clear out some of the excess metal that's still here. Um, this is why some of this work takes so long, because you're trying to minimize how much you can move, but at the same time, you want to be able to drop it in, fully weld it in, you have no gaps in the weld where moisture and rust can come back later. Um, this could be probably one of the most extensive parts of the job when you're doing one of these. Um, we're trying to hit this uh, as aggressively and quickly as possible, uh, but sometimes, you know, the, the little subtle details can really encapsulate a lot of time. You see over here what we're talking about? This is what we have to get after now. We're going to put this pan to drop in. We've got to blow this out. Yeah, well, you can see where it's yeah. Yeah. Most of it's going to give up on the chisel, so let's see what we can do. Yeah, what we have here is uh, this pink stuff here, if you notice. It's called Weld Through Primer. The reason we do is we put, place this on the corners here, on the welding spots of the floorboard. And what we do is this prevents uh, rust later on uh, after the vehicle's been exposed to elements. So it's just a kind of a preventive measure that we use to do for high quality vehicles. Okay, so in the middle of building this, this uh, the New York Spider, I kind of want to touch base on some things that could be somewhat suggestive as to how complicated it is to make the massive repairs that that car needs. Um, so I thought we should back up a little bit so people could get an understanding of the construction process of a car. This is a 1933 Packard, an exceptionally rare car, but it's also representative of the common build practices back in the 30s. So what we're going to do is we're going to explain why certain problems become relevant on each one of these cars. Back in the 30s, all the way up into the, the 40s, the common build practice was wood frame. That's what all this black stuff is, it's wood frame. And you'd have steel folded and nailed to it. You did have areas of welding, but the welding processes back then were fairly minimal as compared to by today's standards, okay? So you had wood frame, and you had the metal formed over it and nailed down to it. That was the common approach. Now, somewhere sometime in the post-war era, things got a little different because what happened was is production of vehicles had to ramp up. You could no longer build 10, 15, 20 cars a day. You had to build, you had to build massive amounts of cars. And what that did is it had to change how we did things. Construction of a car had to increase and the safety had to increase. So by the time the 50s came along, like on this 57 uh, Ford truck, you saw very little, very little wood connected to these cars anymore. What you saw was a lot of actual uh, stick welding construction and some resistance welding. Um, these cars also had their own problems with uh, levels of rust, but this is an American steel car. American steel, by all accounts and purposes, was superior to most steel manufacturing at the time. That's why a lot of these stood up for the test of time. Well, the Italians didn't really have that luck. What they did with the, uh, with the Alfa Romeos, especially the post-war Alfa Romeos, is they got into bed with the Russians, and it's a fairly well-documented storyline that the Russians were, for lack of a better term, selling them uh, the, the least desirable steel they had, as it was called the non-military grade steel. So oftentimes, these cars would literally come out of the factory rusting, and you just didn't know it. Now, the last time this car was on the road was in 1978. So effectively, it had less than 10 years on the road. It had massive repairs to the floors. And here we are 35 plus years later. And this thing hasn't seen that sunlight, but you can see that there is just a ton of rust that's associated with this car. Now, things to know. This car was built primarily on the resistance weld process. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Resistance weld is an ideal thing for mass production and it works great, but the problem with resistance weld is, is during its initial design, you had two pieces of bare steel and you had two electrodes on each side of it, effectively pinching it. 
and wherever it pinched, it would press and it would create a welded surface. So in the process of putting in a floor, for example, you would have uh, effectively 100 plus resistance welds just on one floor section. Now you think about this, this is broken up in four grids, although back then when this was produced, it was two grids. But the point is, is a resistance weld is an ideal way for a mass production car, but it has its errors. When you are tearing one of your cars apart, you'll find that the inside of the car is probably very well seam sealed from the factory. That's that gray putty kind of like stuff, almost like a window glazing that's on the inside. But effectively nothing was done underneath. So where all those welds are lapped over one another, that's an exposed environment. Well, you think about it, where you need the most protection is in the environment, not so much in the cab. So that's why these things also inherited a lot of rust, because the exteriors weren't nearly as protected as the interiors. So here we are replacing all this, and this is a ton of work. It, it's going to take us the whole week, and it's going to take two guys going after eight solid hours a day. It's backbreaking, fatiguing work. And, you know, when it comes to each quarter of a floor, again, there's four quarters, it, it, it's, a, it's a wide open target. You don't know what it's going to take. It can take uh, 10 hours to remove one. It can take 20 hours to remove one. You just don't know because you don't know what you're competing against. You don't know how much of the metal is still there that it's attached to. And you're trying to minimize the damages as you go. If it was spot repair at some point in time, oftentimes they use brass welding techniques. Brass welding is not a bad idea to, for spot repairs, but it is a nightmare to get out when you're trying to replace the floor with a, a peri-correct style flooring. Anyhow, so now you're starting to get the understanding of how this was done. Now what we can't do is we can't just cut out some of the metal and lap over another floor, because at that point we'll have three layers of resistance weld in place. That is going to be problematic very short in this car's future, so we have to get rid of a lot of the dead metal and re- uh, construct the way it was done just with different welding techniques. That's why we also use the Wealthy Primer because right where all the welds are at, the primer will burn off there but effectively it stays contained to just where the welding process was so the primer stays in place everywhere else, minimizing the rust. Now once it's all said and done, we are going to seam seal not only the inside but the outside. We're going to protect all the metal because if you don't protect it, it's sure to repeat its, its rusting issues regardless of how much improved the floors are from what they used to be. So next we're going to show you what the resistance weld looks like and you can see where there's pluses and minuses to that. Okay, so this is the shop version of a resistance welder, okay? This is the controller box and timer. This is the actual resistance welder. This entire bottom section here is just a massive transformer. That's all it is. Okay, and basically what happens is, is you push down the handle which compresses the clamps, you pull the trigger, and it fuses two pieces of metal together. Now, when this process was first used, where the two pieces of metal came in contact with one another, you got to think about it, there's thousands upon thousands of welds on a car. Where these two areas first came in contact, neither of those two surfaces would have been primed. They didn't have weld through primers that were uh, mass produced at the time. So anyway, so what would happen is, is these two areas would be resistance welded together. You would have an open gap right there. And essentially that's where your rusting would start. The resistance weld itself would stay fairly well in contact with the duration of the car's life. The areas in between where the metal is gapping, moisture would collect in there and that area would thin out and that would be the way for rust to start its, its activities. So what would happen is, it would go down an assembly line if you will, and somebody would have one of these and a gigantic articulated arm to counterbalance its heaviness. This, this thing's heavy, this weighs about 80 pounds. And he comes down and he resistance welds all over the place. Buzz, buzz, buzz. And these two things come together. Now these would be two virgin pieces of metal with no distortion in them. But what would happen is, is right where the resistance weld comes in contact, that immediate area of the contact heats up and when it cools down it shrinks. When it shrinks, the area around it expands a little bit and it does not shrink. So you get little distortions, just like this metal's curved right here, you would get these little distortions which would create a little bit of an air gap. And that's where the rusting process would always start its life. You can see there's flaws in this process. So sometime in the late 80s, Mercedes-Benz, uh, BMW, and Ford all started looking at a different way of constructing cars. 
yes, they started to develop much better welding primers to minimize the, the quickness in which a car would rust, but they also started looking at other ways to construction. That's why nowadays a lot of cars are constructed with what's called bonding agents. They're not welds at all. It's literally just two chemicals, like an epoxy, if you will, that fuses panels together. Their collision rate is really high and they hold together quite well, but their tear off is quite simple. It's a fantastic way of doing things and it also keeps rusting from happening. So the build, uh, the build process of a car is increased. The ability to deliver a car has gone up exponentially and the rusting has minimalized. Um, we do our best to make sure that we remove only the necessary components that are beyond repair. Uh, as you see right here, we just took out a big chunk of the middle rocker uh, on this spider. Uh, the reason we did that is because it, you know, the metal was just not salvageable. Uh, but again, if you mess with the uh, inner rocker and any of its components, the, the vehicle could be very costly in replacing and also could compromise the structural integrity of the vehicle. Uh, so it's in our best interest to make sure that we you know, really save and salvage every bit we can. We don't want to mess with the you know, structural integrity. And so, you know, once we get this polished up, get it, you know, as new as possible, uh, we'll place, replace the outer, the outer rocker with this shell um, and uh, weld it to it. So, I mean, this is a very important part of the, uh, the vehicle itself, and uh, it's, the, it's the core of the vehicle. So, uh, we can't really continue uh, cutting any more off or, you know, repairing too much more because we have to wait until the, uh, we have the, the back floorboards installed. Uh, we have to put the front ones in, and as soon as we're done with installing the front floorboards, then the then the uh, the vehicle will have more structural capability for us to do more modifications. So we need to get the front floorboards in, and as soon as that's installed, then we can start really going after this, you know, the uh, middle rockers, and really start working on that. And again, you know, we're doing it for the uh, structural integrity of the vehicle, and so we want to make sure this thing uh, can hold and and will last the test of time. Vintage Customs. Uh, what we're working on today is uh, seats from a 69 Spider. Now I've taken, the back is obviously taken off of the bottom and what I've done is I've taken the seat apart and I've made templates using what is already existing. Um, and the things that I look for is trying to better the seat um, than before it was put together. Um, I look for anything and, and everything that I can do to make it better, stronger, look more, uh, more presentable. Um, and what we've done is I've taken the center out of the back and this is called a tuck and roll. Now back in the day you can see how it is all sewn but you can't see any of the stitch. And this is what we have here as well. So how I can improve and make that better is you can see how this looks. Well back in the day what they used to do is they used to take a piece of material just like this. They would fold it over and do this and run their stitch along that inside line and then this is how you have that effect. If you can see closely all it is, it's folded over one way, you grab that stitch and it pulls back this way and that's how you can hide that stitch. Now the problem that I have with that is because you're doing it all one way, if you look at this, that tuck and roll lays all one way. It's just like when you're mowing your lawn. If you go down one way, all the grass is going to lay one way. When you come back, that grass is going to lay the opposite. Well, I don't want all of this tuck and roll to lay one way. So what you can see I've done here is I've stitched up a bunch of channels. Now what I do with these channels is I will literally take these channels fold them together and flip this over and now I'm going to run my line right on the inside of this barely a 3 8 inch seam allowance and then what happens with that stitch is that it's all uniform so it doesn't lay one way and then this is the result that we get. So the only other difference is 
we're trying to improve, so what they've used is quarter inch foam. I have used half inch, and that is how you're going to get so much more definition. Now you can see that it's much more uniform. All of these are sitting and rolling the way they should, as opposed to sitting and rolling all one way. Hey, this is Rocket here at the uh, Vintage Customs. Uh, what I'm doing basically yesterday, I spent the majority of the day uh, just really sanding and cleaning this inner rocker out. Uh, the inner rocker is, is the structural, main structural integrity of, on these uh, spiders just because they don't have a, a roof to support it. So it's very important that we keep this inner rocker in the best pristine condition and restore it to the best ability that we can. And what we used is just a small sander getting all the debris, dirt, rust, everything out of here as best as we could. Uh, and then I applied Pour 15 which is a sealing compound that pretty much protects this inner rocker for a lifetime and it's water resistant and rust resistant so it's in perfect condition. Um, I also applied a uh, well through pr copper primer uh, and that basically again is a, it's a protectant, it also assists in MIG welding uh, and wa uh, waterproofs it also. So it's a kind of a dual protection uh, thing that we're doing here. Next thing I'm going to do is fabric, uh, refabricate this uh, front leading edge of the uh, inner rocker and the reason we're doing that is so we can uh, this is the floor, the front floor, and we need to put this, uh, re, you know, recreate this part here through a 14 gauge American hot rolled steel. So we're using that. It's actually a better metal than what's in here already because this is obviously Russian metal. So what we're going to do is as soon as we, we're going to cut this out and apply it and weld it later. Um, here, actually, I'll cut it right now. So here we go. We're gonna cut this, start cutting this thing out. The reason we have this level here is the uh, lower rocker has a continuous taper. So that's why we're, follow, we're putting that there so we can follow the natural curves of the uh, body, its original body frame itself. And also, the part that I'm welded in makes it a lot less confusing when you actually weld it in itself. Well, as usual, you gotta uh, ignore the sounds we got going on around here. This is kind of a common problem. You're ready to change out this lower section of this duetto. Now, just because the panel goes all the way across its way up here doesn't mean that's what we need to change out. We need to minimize how much we're cutting out exclusively to how much rust we have. Now, I have a huge amount of rust here and have rust all the way down the low wall of the belt line. So, we are going to cut at least an inch to two inches above the, the thinned out metal and an inch to two inches past the thinned out metal. Let's get started.